Welcome everyone to the launch of the 2.0 of Abolish Slavery VT campaign. This is a joint effort of the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance as well as the Interfaith Action. My name is uh, Reverend Mark Hughes. I'm the Executive Director of Vermont Racial Justice Alliance. So I'm gonna be your MC this evening. Um, you know, we've been at this for quite some time. It's, a, you know, the background on this thing is amazing. Uh, just so you know, uh, some of this stuff started coming up in 2015, 2016, when uh, then the, the organization called Justice for All, which I was the executive, which I am the executive director of, it's a C4, uh, was doing work in our legislature here in Vermont. Uh, one of the things that came to my attention was, is it seemed as though we were always trying to win, we we're always trying to figure out how to change policies that were, um, that were causing us challenges or trying to figure out how do we create new policies. And so the research led us to the constitution. We began to ask one another, where in the constitution are we protected? And uh, not too long in that, in that research began to see in the constitution that the, that the constitution did in fact here in Vermont have three exception clauses, three exception clauses to, um, that, that actually permit slavery. Uh, so that's kind of where some of this work started. Um, just want to let you know that, um, you know, along the way, it's just been amazing how, you know, there's just been a divine appointment, how um, Reverend Ingram, Debbie Ingram was positioned right at the right time and in the right place when, when we were um, preparing to get this work happen. And uh, every step along the way, there's been, um, you know, and I'll tell you more about, you know, we'll tell you more about the history and the background and the story later, but every step along the way, it's just been interesting. It's been uh, twisty and turny. Uh, it's been fun. It's been challenging. It's been frustrating. Um, but now here we are and we're in the fourth quarter. Uh, I'm excited. Um, I'm also excited, you know, where my faith intersects with uh, truth and justice uh, and to be in a place like this and at a time like this. Uh, I don't think that at any other time in history that anybody has been in a place in a time that we are in today together right now. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Uh, what we know is, is that the Constitution of the state of Vermont has been in place for 245 years. How many people would agree on that? What we also know is, is that we are at a place in history at an unprecedented time when we're not going to talk about all of the other things that are going on around us, the things, you know, please turn the TV off right now. Don't pay any attention to that because we'll get to that later. You can handle that later. But, but there are so many things that are happening right now. And I think I heard somebody say, what a time to be alive. What a time to be alive. You know, it, right now, the, the likelihood, Earl, of somebody uh, being alive at this time, you know, if you think about all of our children, their children, their children, uh, if you think about all our parents, our grandparents, their, their parents, and all that other stuff, I, I'm, I'm trying to get you fired up, if, but I shouldn't have to work very hard. What a time to be alive right now. This We are on a precipice of something that is so amazing right now. We are doing things right now that are so unprecedented. We are making changes right now as, as people. Right now, is what we're doing is we're affecting policy. We're affecting things that are going to have generational change that happen. There, there, there's going to be something that's cascading from the work that we're doing, not just this work alone, but, but this right here. I mean, what more can you do if you want to create systemic and institutional change than go after the Constitution? So this is, this is, this is incredibly powerful, the work that we're doing. And it's probably not well liked by some, probably not well received. And, and you're probably going to get some pushback from time to time. You're probably going to hear some folks uh, saying, you know, I don't know why you're, I mean, I know I certainly have. I don't know why you're working on that. We abolished slavery. You know, we were the first state to abolish slavery. I don't even know why you're doing that. That's just ridiculous. I don't know what it means. Why are you so excited about that, sir? Why does that bother you so much? That we're having a constitution, that we're having a constitutional amendment, rhetorically, a constitutional amendment um, to abolish slavery. Could it be that the last time this country sought to abolish slavery, that 620,000 people died over it? This is a big deal. 
So, so we can't take the institution lightly. We can't take the institution of slavery lightly. So I just want to congratulate you guys. I, every single person in the folks that are not on, are, are on here, I'm so proud of all of you guys who are on here tonight, the work that you've done, the work that you've committed to, the work that we're gonna all have the opportunity to do together uh, as we hold hands and as we move forward together, black, white, yellow, green, Presbyterian, Catholic, Muslim, Jew, I don't care, we're all moving together. Uh, we're all holding hands, we're moving together. This is interfaith, this is racial justice. We're doing this work together. We're, we're learning together, we're learning of the connection of the institution of slavery, its connection to this, this quagmire of systemic racism, uh, this, the, this, the challenges that we're facing with the, the consistent and persistent insid insidious uh, outcomes that we see of all social determinants that consistently produce racially disparate outcomes to our brothers and sisters. I heard, I think I heard, I think it was um, the Reverend William Barber, he said, he said, somebody's hurting my brother and it's gone on far too long. Is that what they said, Earl? He said, it's gone on far too long. And, and he said, and we won't, Earl, can you help me? How, how's that, can you just take yourself off mute for a minute? And, and we and, won't and be and silent we, anymore. And we won't be silent anymore. How many people believe that tonight? How many people are ready to go? How many people are ready to move forward? If you're ready to move forward, just wave your hand tonight. If you're ready to move forward, just give a shout tonight. I don't even care if I hear you or not. Just give a shout and say, let's go. Another thing he says, forward together. And what, is they, what do they say after that, Earl? What do they say, forward not, together? Not one step back. Step back is what he says. So let's go, folks. Let's go tonight. Let's get this done. Uh, it's credentialing time. We're a couple minutes ahead of schedule, but that's how we roll. So it's credentialing time. Um, it's customary. Um, at Vermont Interfaith Action Events to provide uh, credentials that just simply explain what organization, what, uh, what an organization is and, and what its purpose is. Uh, I'd like to invite Reverend Josh Simon, I'll let your boy, to give the VIA credential and Isaac Owusu to uh, give the, VR, uh, the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance credentials. Uh, come on, y'all. Reverend Simon. He was here a minute ago. He may have just, just dropped the call. Isaac, can we start with you, bud? Of course, of course. Nice to see all you kings and queens. All right, I'm Isaac Owusu, the Director of Community Engagement and Support for the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance. Our mission is to secure sustainable power, ensure agency, and provide security for African descendants of slavery while embracing their history and preserving their culture. And we carry out this work in four pillars. First one being platforms and initi initiatives, which include the reason why you guys are all here today, abolish slavery, racism as a public health emergency, and various other uh, works such as Champlain Parkway, and et cetera. Out the second being outreach and education, our Thursday night abolish slavery Zoom calls with the Abolish Slavery Network. Max, Yusuf, I see you in the building. Our definition of systemic racism, economics of systemic racism, my personal community engagement and support we you know we offer first fridays for the black community query forms to assist the community grant program and rapid response black space various other initiatives lastly cultural empowerment our richard kemp center that we just set up this year we hope all you guys can join us at some point our wellness working group and last but not least august 27th first african landing day we hope to see some of you guys this Faces. Our mission is an intentional response to systemic racism in the United States. And the reason why you are all here today is because you are aware. You are the change. Whether you know it now or not, this is a monumental step towards changing systemic racism. This is historic. And thank you all for being here. Thank you, Isaac. Thank you, Isaac. Is Josh in the house? Josh, make it? Yes, he is. Yes. <laughs> Simon, please. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Josh. I'm a member of, uh, well, I'm the Associate Pastor at First Congregational Church in Essex Junction. I'm also on the board of VIA, as, and I serve as uh, board president. 
Vermont Interfaith Action is a coalition of more than 70 congregations and individual persons of faith who work together to effect systemic change around social, just, social justice issues facing our communities and our state. Altogether, we represent about 16,000 people. And the way that we affect systemic change is by being aware of our power. Each one of us that's on this call has power. Can you believe it? You actually do. You may be one of several hundred thousand people in the state, but you have power to affect change. And one of the ways that we affect change is by showing up. So thank you for showing up. Another way is by advocating to our state legislators on behalf of ourselves and behalf, on behalf of people who, are, who, who do not benefit from our system. And, and, and in fact, probably are taken, are disadvantaged by our system. So we have the power to uh, affect change by showing up, by uh, advocating, and of course, most importantly, this time, this time around of year is, is to volunteer to get more people out to vote. When we organize people to get out to vote, we increase our effectiveness and we will then win. So uh, I'm glad you've joined us. I'm glad that you have joined us so you can become more aware of the power that you have and the ways that uh, we can effect change this year. Our goal in VAA across all our issues is to improve the quality of life for all Vermonters, bringing the values of justice and compassion to the public square as our faith traditions guide us. Thank you. Josh, thank you. Uh, Isaac, thank you as well. We are going to uh, keep it moving. Uh, right now, I'm gonna, we're going to take a little time. Uh, it looks like we are almost right on schedule. Uh, just tell you a little bit about Proposal 2, a little bit about Proposal 2. I know that there are, everybody on here is already an expert. I know you guys have already done your homework and everybody has figured out uh, what this thing is all about. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to keep it out of the bushes and tell you just a little bit about, you know, where we're coming from and, and what's happening here. What we know is, is that, you know, here uh, within uh, the, um, the state of Vermont, uh, there, there has been um, quite, the, quite the hoopla about, you know, who we are in, in our, um, our um, I'm just going to say exceptionalism. Uh, we've, we've talked a lot about the fact that we were, have been the first state to abolish slavery. Um, and um, I think now it's time for us to change the narrative because what we've discovered along the way, and we didn't realize it uh, before, uh, was is that um, that's just simply not the case. The, the facts just don't bear it out in the analysis that we've done. And that's what we've done is we've done our job and we've done the analysis. We know about the constitution being written in 1777, um, we know um, that um, Vermonters have been taught what they've been taught, but I don't know what's on the next slide, but I think we don't really need this slide, though, but we can keep it going. But here is the Constitution uh, itself, and, and I think just to make it very clear is, is when we, um, I told you it took about, I think I, I've, I've always said it takes about 23 seconds to discover that slavery was never abolished in the state. Um, as we talk about um, the introduction to Proposal 2, I just think it's important for us to stand on the fact that the language does not support the narrative that we were the first state to abolish slavery. So all we, all we got to do is, is just take a look here and we see that persons born uh, equally free and independent and have certain natural inherent and unalienable rights amongst which are the enjoying and defending of life and liberty acquiring and possessing and protecting property and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. Therefore, no person born in this country or brought from overseas ought to be holding by law to serve any person as servant, slave, or apprentice after arriving to the age of 21 years, unless bound by the person's own consent after arriving to such age 
or bound by the law for payments of debts and damages, fines and costs and the like. And the reason why we have those different colors there is just to communicate the various ways in which slavery is actually permitted. I think it, it should also um, be stated at this point is, is that in 1777, no other state in the United States had a constitution that had any language that permitted or denied language, uh, or denied rather slavery. So Vermont was the first state in the United States to have any language uh, concerning slavery whatsoever. And, and what they did with that language was created these three exception clauses to permit slavery. So just to be very, very clear, there were three states and one territory that would go on to create what we refer to as exception clause, clauses or loopholes within their constitutions as well. Uh, they were Oregon, uh, Ohio, and I believe Alabama, and then I think the Northwest Territory would come later. So these are the three exception clauses that were permitted. And the reason why we have this conversation is, is you know, unlike perhaps almost half of America, we have to deal with facts in order to really create a premise upon what it is we're doing the work. The work is amend the Constitution. Um, the work is amend the Constitution. If there's nothing, if, if there's no reason to amend it, then it certainly would not have made it through the legislature two times. Uh, and it definitely would not be up for um, on the ballot today. So just as we, as, I inter, as we introduce you to this today, just embrace the fact that yes, it's necessary. No, it is, it is not just uh, one of those feel good things that we're doing because the language reflects the institution of slavery. And what we know about the institution of slavery is it has done a tremendous amount of harm to us as a nation. So it is, it is imperative that we um, amend this constitution to remove this, to um, prohibit slavery and indentured servitude. So just so we know, it's not, an, it's not symbolic. It's very, very important that we address this language because it's not just uncomfortable and inappropriate language. It, it is foul uh, and it, is, it represents an institution that has caused and continues to create damage across the United States. Um, that 13th Amendment thing that we were talking about a moment ago uh, has everything to do with what I'm talking about now, because even 157 years ago, as a nation, when we decided after those 620,000 people killed one another in defense of or uh, trying to ward off this institution called slavery, um, what happened was it still was not abolished not even in on a federal level. Now, don't feel embarrassed and don't feel uncomfortable with this because our numbers tell us that 78% of people in the United States do not know what I'm about to tell you. And that is, is that slavery uh, or involuntary servitude, except for the punishment for crime whereof a party shall been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude. And what that means is, is that for the last 157 years, much of a, many of us as a nation, we believe that slavery was prohibited even on a national level, and it was not. Uh, chattel slavery was, but state and prison slavery was instituted. And Vermont has been silent for the last 157 years on this matter as well. So these are the facts. This is... Uh, this is what we are here to, um, to address. It's very important for us also, as we look at this information, is to understand that we could be a part of a larger effort. What do you mean? Well, we were already a part of a larger effort historically because we started a, a, a domino effect of other states um, creating uh, exception clauses within their constitutions because those three states in that Northwestern Territory that I told you about previously, they were the impetus for a couple of dozen other states to begin implementing within their constitutions exception clauses as well. And, and this can be directly traced back 
to convict leasing and what actually was the premise for convict leasing. So my colleague Max tells me that this is referred to in his world as the butterfly effect. In fact, what we are renowned for, as hard as it is for us to embrace, is, is that we were the we were the first state in the United States to create a domino effect that would institute exception clauses across multiple states, up to 25 states, where in which this undergirded the institution of convict leasing. Uh, it started here in our state, in Vermont. So this is another reason why it's so important that this work that we're doing is, is, is done, is because we, we owe this to ourselves as a state, and we also owe this to a nation. It's not, again, it's not just symbolic. And I think um, in closing, and I, I don't, I don't want to take this thing too far, um, and I certainly don't want to push the time on this, but I, I, I think it's very, very important to understand that the proposal, all it does is it just proposes that slavery and indentured servitude in any form are prohibited. That is all. So all of the bad language that we were talking about, that language that's, that did so much across such a long period of time, 245 years, um, we will strike and we will replace that with this, this language here. Let me tell you where we're challenged before I go. See, because what we're really doing is, is we, are, we are getting in line with states at a national level to at, perhaps at some time, at some point or another, you know, come to a total of 38 states. So maybe we could, for once in, in the existence of the history of this country, be a nation that prohibits slavery once and for all without exception. That is the 13th Amendment. But in the meantime, while we're here in our state, what we can do is, is we can abolish it here and understand that this, this is, this undergirds the entire conversation that we're having about the impact that systemic racism has on us here in this nation. So as we have already began to disentangle many policies, you've seen the health equity bill this last year, you've seen the economic equity bill, which stayed on the wall, you saw the, the joint resolution, which we call our R113, the joint legislative resolution declaring racism as a public health emergency. You've seen the racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice system advisory panel. You've seen the appointment of the racial equity executive director and other work in the city of Burlington. The work must go on, but now we've found the foundation of it, and this is where the action starts. So I thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to move on. I'd like to invite right now and recognize some folks tonight for, for, a, roll, for a roll call. I want to recognize who's here tonight uh, in conducting the roll, the, the roll call. Uh, we've got a number of folks that are on the call. Uh, Debbie, you can help me out with this roll call because I've never done it before and I'm not ashamed to ask for help. Uh, yeah, so Lucy, uh, Lucy is going to do the roll call. There she is, live on your uh, screen. <laughs> Hey, Lucy, um, you got it. Thank you so for saving Mark, my life. I'm, I'm happy to help with this. And uh, the reason this is really important tonight is that this really important message that Mark has really encapsulated for us, we are representing communities to bring that message to with clarity. So this is the way for us to celebrate that and make record of it. So I'm going, my name is Lucy Samara. I'm a member of the local organizing ministry for public safety with VIA and a member of First Congregational Church of Burlington, United Church of Christ. Um, when you hear your community's name called, I want you to unmute yourself and make some glorious noise, some noise of commitment, some noise of joy that you represent a community that you're going to really make a very aware of this issue. So this passes in November. Uh, Christchurch Presbyterian. Yay! Good Shepherd Episcopal in Barry. Abolish Woo! slavery now. Yay! Congregation of Temple Sinai. College Street Congregational Church in Burlington. Woo! Yeah! Woo Christ Episcopal Church ah. of Montpelier. Unitarian Church of Montpelier. Yes. 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 The old meeting house. I lost my spot. I was so excited by your call out. The old meeting house in East Montpelier. Cathedral Church of St. Paul in Burlington. Good Shepherd Lutheran in Jericho. Greensboro, United Church of Christ. 
We're here. Yay, New Alpha Missionary Baptist Church. Yay. Hola. Good to see you again. First Congregational Church of Essex Junction. <laughs> First Congregational Church of Burlington. Whoop, 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 whoop. We can do this. Interested persons from other communities of faith, organizations, and towns in Vermont. Uh, Chapel Ch Sinai, a little late. Hooray! <laughs> Thank you all for being here and for the work that you will be doing. Hey, how about First UU of Burlington? Woo! There you are, Zoe. I don't know why that we. I don't know why you're on the list. First Zoe the and one. Adam and Iris. A few of us are here. Yeah, there's all kind of. Anybody oh, else want to call out their specific congregation? Yes, Un Universalist Unitarian Congregation of St. Johnsbury. Beautiful. Oh, oh not my church, but still. <laughs> it's great to have you all here. Waybridge, Congregational Church in Waybridge, UCC. Welcome, Waybridge. Yeah. Hi, welcome. welcome, welcome, welcome. We get everybody, Lucy? We did All fantastic. Ready to mobilize. Every, sounds like everybody's ready to go, and we're still and we're still on time. So, I'd like to invite uh, Reverend Debbie Ingram, my partner in crime, my one of my favorite people on the planet, uh, to share with us some of the background and the historical information about abolishing uh, slavery. Thank you, Debbie. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mark. I appreciate it. Yes. Um, so I've done this presentation uh, in uh, a good many of our congregations across the state. And um, uh, what, what it attempts to do is kind of explain uh, a little bit about the, the history of slavery in our country and, um, and then talk about how that legacy has uh, been carried with us really up until the present day and, and the ramifications of that. And then talk about uh, the Vermont uh, situation specifically and what we can what we can do about it going forward. So this is some this is some information uh, for you. Um, the legacy of slavery uh, is that uh, the first documented slaves were brought to uh, um, this new continent of America, or it was new for uh, for the white people in Europe who discovered it, um, discovered in quotes. Um, so they brought slaves in uh, 1619. That was the first time that it was documented. And then we know that the British Empire brought slaves to the American colonies steadily throughout the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, so much so that by 1776, when some people were gaining their freedom um, in America, uh, slavery was legal in every colony um, for other folks. So the if we look at the numbers of uh, people who were affected, the, the U.S. Census started tracking slaves and free Blacks beginning in 1790 uh, and lasting up until 1860. Um, so there's 698,000 slaves that made up 18% of the U.S. population in 1790, and only 60,000 free blacks. And then by 1860, there were 4 million slaves, and they made up 12.5% of the U.S. population because the white population had grown faster. But that's still a very significant portion of the population. And many more were transported. Um, uh, 12 to 13 million Africans were kidnapped and transported to America as slaves. Um, several million additional persons didn't survive the journey. We've all seen the, the, the horror of the, the ships, um, the people dying from uh, the brutality inflicted on them, from um, malnourishment, from disease. In some years, there was an estimated 23% of those transported who did not survive. Uh, and so from the time of the uh, Vermont Constitution being written uh, throughout the Civil War, there, were, there was an attempt to, um, to uh, abolish slavery, but as we've already seen, as Mark has already uh, pointed out, um, these attempts were had exceptions, every, every one of them. Uh, the, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation um, only freed slaves in the uh, southern states uh, that were fighting against the Union. 
Uh, the 13th Amendment um, was ratified in 1865, but as we've also already seen, it had an exception for uh, punishment of a crime. So throughout this entire um, era of our of our history, American history, we have we have never really not uh, had slavery, had slavery legal in some form in this country. Now, Reconstruction, uh, there were some attempts uh, to, um, to bring uh, uh, a better um, uh, uh, status here in, in America. Uh, the Civil Rights Act uh, of 1866 and the Civil Rights Act of 1875 did affirm the equality of, of all, um, all men, um, which is, brings up another problem uh, for women later, but uh, the equality of all men before the law. Uh, they prohibited racial discrimination in public places and facilities and made it a crime to deny accommodations or services on the basis of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. But um, nonetheless, uh, regardless of the fact that uh, there was some of that formalized in Reconstruction, uh, there was still uh, this insidious evil of um, racism and um creating some way to basically uh, enslave people, even if chattel slavery no longer existed. So black codes were established that imprisoned uh, black people for vagrancy, loitering, and petty theft. You know, these were the kinds of minor crimes that white people might not even be uh, arrested for, much less imprisoned for. Uh, convict leasing became a very common practice. So the Plantation owners or business owners um, could um, uh, could pay the prisons to um, give them labor uh, for the the convicts who were who were imprisoned. Um, black people were not able to rent housing or buy land, and they were paid a pittance for their labor. Uh, adults were forced into annual labor contracts, and children into what were called apprenticeships. So essentially, uh, folks who had quote unquote, been freed from uh, the plantation life that they had uh, undergone, uh, really had no choice but to go back to, to that same kind of work. They, they worked in the same kind of conditions, uh, just under a different name, but it was exactly, they were treated horribly. So the 14th Amendment um, uh, also uh, was part of Reconstruction, which we would have thought would have, would have been a good thing. Uh, it, it granted citizenship and equal protection under the law to all persons born or naturalized in the United States, including former enslaved persons. But uh, as we've seen in our era, the Supreme Court uh, basically overturned um, uh, this, the, this good uh, amendment. Um, the rulings in 1883 uh, stated that this amendment and the 13th Amendment were not infringed by uncodified racial discrimination. So essentially, uh, discrimination could not be constitutionally prohibited. This is what the Supreme Court of the time ruled in, a, in an eight to one, um, in eight to one rulings. So that opened the way for the Jim Crow laws that we're all familiar with. Uh, uh, segregation in every realm, parks, restaurants, theaters, buses, public pools, hospitals, schools, uh, ev everywhere. Uh, marriage and cohabitation uh, among Blacks and whites uh, were prohibited. Uh, black people could not register to vote. Um, and this was prevalent. This started in the South, but it became prevalent in every region of the country. And so uh, this idea about convict leasing um, gave way then uh, to um, under, underpaid or unpaid labor by prisoners. And incarceration really can be argued to be a form of, uh, of slavery. Uh, black people are uh, disproportionately affected uh, by this practice. They are incarcerated at 6.4 times the rate of whites. Uh, the war on drugs, which took place under several presidents of both parties, uh, ha has led to the mass incarceration, particularly Black men, in far greater numbers than they exist in the general population. Um, also, the private prison industry, just the, just the concept of uh, some people making money off of the imprisonment of other people can certainly be argued to be a type of slavery. 
And then sending prisoners to other states um, can be viewed, viewed as human trafficking. And Vermont does this. We send um, some of our prisoners to the state of Mississippi to a private prison um, every year. Another way that we have um, substituted um, uh, another horrible uh, institution for uh, the institution of chattel slavery, another way that essentially black people are enslaved uh, in modern times is, is through poverty. Uh, this, uh, this graph shows the poverty rate by race uh, from 1959 to 2019. And you'll see that um, the highest poverty rate is for is for Black people at, uh, at uh, more than double what it is for for whites. And then this is another way of measuring poverty. This is the median household income by race. Um, and here, Black households are at the bottom uh, of the household income at, at around forty five thousand. And uh, whites, Asians, uh, Hispanics all all have much higher household incomes. And then a third way that um, slavery uh, exists today in modern times is through the racial wealth gap. Um, uh, and this is, uh, as opposed to income, this is about accumulated wealth uh, that uh, most people get through, uh, through, through the generations. They inherit money from their parents and grandparents and, and uh, families build wealth over time and generations. But we see in, in the United States, um, white people have a median uh, net worth. So that would be the, you know, the amount of wealth that they've accumulated at uh, very close to $200,000. Uh, whereas black people, um, black households have closer to about uh, 25,000. So there's a huge disparity there. And this racial wealth gap has been caused by, um, by very deliberate mechanisms like a racially restrictive covenants in land and housing deeds, uh, by the practice of redlining um, that prevented mortgages from being issued to Black Americans, uh, by the lack of access to the GI Bill, which helps uh, people buy houses and helps them to get an education. Um, many Black people were locked out of that. Um, it's also been called by segregation due to Jim Crow laws in places where people would live and in the development of uh, white only suburbs and has continued into the into the 21st century through the disproportionate impact of the 2008 subprime mortgage crisis. So those those three ways in incarceration, poverty and uh, wealth disparities are, are ways that um, the, the legacy of slavery has been handed down into to modern times. And this exists, lest, lest you think that, uh, as we sometimes like to try to think, uh, that Vermont is an exception, um, that simply is not true. Um, there, there's lots and lots of data, but just here's just a, a snippet. Um, the population uh, percentage of Blacks in Vermont is only one and a half percent but the percent, the black percentage of our prison population is 9.9%. The uh, percentage of the population at or below poverty level is 25.9% versus 10.4% for whites in Vermont. The unemployment rate is uh, is higher 4.4 uh, compared to 3.5. And this is um, housing data. If you just look at the two bars on the uh, far left, uh, you'll see that it's just about reversed uh, in terms of um, ability to own homes in Vermont. Uh, white people, 72% uh, of white people, white Vermonters uh, are able to own their own home, whereas only 24% of uh, black Vermonters uh, are. So what are we going to do about this? Uh, and, and what are we trying uh, to do? Um, well, there is, as, as Mark mentioned, there uh, the idea of the 13th Amendment and closing that, that loophole um, is being addressed at the national level, um, uh, but it's just, just slowly getting off the ground. In, in June of 2021, um, uh, two legislators uh, introduced uh, what would be the 28th Amendment uh, to the U.S. Constitution, which would take out the, um, uh, the slavery clause. 
but in the meantime, uh, as, as is so often the case, when things can't move at the national level, uh, the states are beginning to create momentum um, uh, at, you know, at, at, at our level. So um, this is a map of uh, talking about uh, states that have slavery or some mention of slavery in their, in, in their constitution. Um, you'll see it's widespread, um, you know, all over the country. And the Abolished Slavery National Network has, uh, has been at the forefront of this movement uh, to help states and to bring states together uh, to address this. Four states have already abolished slavery in their constitutions, Rhode Island, Colorado, Nebraska, and Utah. Uh, other states besides Vermont are in, in process of this, um, Oregon, Tennessee, Louisiana, California, um, and there are others also that are trying to get uh, measures like this on their ballots. So there, there truly is a, a movement. And then um, in terms of talking about uh, the other ramifications and impact of, um, of our legacy of slavery, uh, the UN has, has made uh, statements about um, about systemic racism, that systemic racism exists in the United States uh, and that we remain a, a chronically segregated society. And there's, there's, uh, there's proof there uh, in many different, many different forms. And their concluding statement then is that these shameful statistics can only be explained by longstanding structural discrimination on the basis of race, reflecting the enduring legacy of slavery. So the good news is Vermont has been uh, a state that has uh, begun to acknowledge that systemic racism exists. Um, uh, we have at least released some reports and some statements that um, we, we know that there is such a thing as systemic racism. Uh, Mark uh, worked really hard uh, and the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance um, to make sure that we have a, uh, an executive director of racial equity uh, whose job is to identify and work to eradicate systemic racism within state government. So there, there is some progress on that front, we're glad to say. And, but the, what we would be doing with amending our constitution would be really moving that bar e even higher and, 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 and continuing to, to really push the idea that we need to, we acknowledge that there is great uh, inequity, uh, to acknowledge that there is uh, systemic racism by, by implication, uh, and uh, that we really want to try to try to do something about that. And uh, so uh, this outlines the process. It, the, the amendment has had to be approved uh, by both chambers of the General Assembly uh, twice, and that has already happened. And then um, the way our amendment process works, uh, it goes straight to the people and um, the people uh, vote um, uh, on whether to uh, ultimately on whether to amend the constitution. So that's where we are now. Uh, we are uh, at, the, at the stage of, you know, we're, we're launching this campaign to make sure that people uh, know and uh, are on board with the idea that slavery is morally abhorrent and it should be unambiguously prohibited. That and then to to we're trying to do education to to help uh, people to understand you know the broader picture that I've just laid out to you that you know chattel slavery is the precursor of slavery in other forms that systemic racism exists today and we have to acknowledge it came from the legacy of slavery and then you know also uh, any system of oppression harms the oppressed and the oppressor Vermont is mostly a white state. A lot of us here tonight are white people, but even as the as the oppressor, um, even if we haven't actively taken that kind of role, we have benefited in, in this system. Uh, in some ways, we have been uh, advantaged, um, you know, financially, economically, but we have been hurt in in terms of our humanity, in terms of our dignity, in terms of our spirituality. Many of us are, you know, we're from uh, communities of faith, and to to keep other people down, to to make it so that we don't recognize the common humanity of all of us, does something harmful to us, 
Uh, and so, you know, we need to recognize that as well. And we will all have a better quality of life if we, uh, if we address and get rid of this, this abhorrent and shameful practice of slavery. So thanks very much for listening. And uh, Mark, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you, Debbie. <clears throat> and thank you for just such a, a rich and incredibly informative uh, research report. Now the time has come for our stories. And uh, this is um, it's a great opportunity for me uh, to introduce you to a few folks who've come to share uh, some stories. Everyday folks is like what we like to say. Uh, not to uh, diminish or demean anyone, but we're all everyday folks, aren't, aren't we? Um, to support the Abolish Slavery campaign. So I think first we'd like to introduce, uh, if you're here, uh, Carla Kelly, are you here? Actually, actually uh, Mark, we're, we had a little change of plans and, and uh, Barbara Thompson is, is uh, gonna be our first uh, speaker. Because Barbara can't oh, stay with okay. us too much. Too much. Sorry about Barbara. that, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, I have to be down to Amtrak pretty soon. Um, I, my, at one of our meetings, Melissa uh, mentioned a comment by someone that it's time to move from comfort into action. And um, I guess that's really the essence of my story as a white person. Uh, I'm very, uh, happy to support this campaign, partly because it's uh, sponsored, it's a cross-racial campaign. It's sponsored by two organizations, uh, one a Black-led organization, the uh, Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, and the other a white-led organization under Debbie's uh, leadership, uh, Vermont Interfaith Action. And I think that is, uh, to me, that was really important that we don't have that many opportunities for a joint action. And I think in the future, we're going to increasingly need that as we fight against some of these forces of oppression in our society. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm not gonna repeat all the things that Debbie said, they're really important and things that we've all been learning. Um, I'm just very happy to be part of this campaign. And I want to say moving from comfort to action is not an easy thing. Uh, it's, you know, it's been hard and it was really scary for me. But by gosh, I did it and I'm going to do it again. And uh, the tabling is, is really an interesting opportunity to meet so many people and to hear their points of view. So. I encourage everyone to join in. Thank you so much, Barbara. It's, it is good to see you, and thank you for your uh, for your story. And I know you're going to have to take off, but stay as long as you can, please. I think we want to go now. Am I right to go to Carla Kelly? I'm I'm, all, I'm almost afraid to do it now because I feel like I didn't get the memo last time. <laughs> sure, let's go to Carla. Hey, Carla. Well, hello, good evening, everybody. Uh, I kind of the honor and the privilege to be among you guys. Um, new to Vermont, but I'm not a stranger when it comes to fighting certain things for social justice in regards to this situation. Um, I was the young lady that helped out on the Juneteenth, and some of the uh, broadcasters had question me. Yeah, your words, Mark. I'm good trouble. <laughs> I'm good trouble across the board. Um, I'm grateful to be here fighting a good cause. Um, in the northern New Jersey, we don't hear about that too much because we intermingle everybody with everybody, you know, and also in Bridgeport, we don't hear about this because everybody is with somebody interracially. And we all are connected by one thing, by the color of blood, which is red. So we are not colorblind to this situation, but I think at this time we are making moves in this direction. Um, I had to educate my children. My daughter's now 15 and my son is nine. And 
they don't see it as a racial issue at times, but they're like confused because they were not brought up hating anyone that didn't look like them. Um, they make friends with pretty much anybody. So you figure, okay, everybody knows. And I believe anywhere beyond going down towards Massachusetts on down, except for maybe Maryland, it's no education boundaries that's being presented to our children at my kids' ages um, or even in the public school system. And it's, it's sad, but it's good, but it's good. And it's not, it's kind of bad because in these situations, they would question me and they would ask, how do I do it? Or why is there racism? Why are they saying Black Lives Matter? Why are they saying this? They ask these questions because once again, they're not taught how to hate anybody because of the color of their skin or any of that sort, but they know we have the color rainbow in our family. So it's like, I, I don't have time to fight and argue with anyone about, you know, anything about that. But when it comes to slavery, I um, remember my mom and my dad telling me stories how our great greats and aunties and uncles were in fact slaves and still it went in one ear out the other. And, we never picked up the conversation again. But my father, you know, was a farmer, you know, born and raised in North Carolina and said, hey, I need to migrate and do something better. So those conversations never made it to the dinner table um, across the board growing up. So to us, it was like, okay, it's normal. But now to be in a state that we are in Vermont, um, we are aware of their slavery. There still be some slavery still in the United States that we may or may not be aware of. But to be a part of a campaign and to watch my two children that are here to listen and to be a part of, like, okay, this do exist. Why does it exist? When? What, what timeline was it? And it's important me as a mom, as a single mom, to teach it to them and to bring these conversations up to them as a part of nature. If your homeschool never says it, you heard it first at home. I, I'm a believer of ministry starts at home, so you have to be able to tell your children at home so in case you have a kid that may or may not understand, hey, why are you playing with me? Because I was taught not to do it. Well, I was taught to respect you. So which one I'm supposed to do? And they have these conversations like, well, why they act different than me? And you have to open up the dialogue to your children, your godchildren, nieces, nephews now, not even because we're in Vermont, wherever they are, because a lot of them are colorblind or confused to what the history books have said. And even like now, they're homeschooled, they are aware of the things, but it's good to bring them a part of different historic moments like this. And I'm happy that I follow God's lead to move up here so they could know, hey, it's okay to ask questions about why is slavery? Why is this? Why is this being abolished? What does that even mean? That's a big word. I don't understand. And to, I, I, I said it during June, uh, the weekend of Juneteenth as well educate your children, educate them, because you be it will be a world of hate all over again, going back to the 1960s, 1950s, and then and so on and so on. So my motto is to educate as much as I can, uh, whether it be men, women, children alike, and when my children are mature enough to hold it down and say, mom, I got this because you showed us how to do. You showed us how to deal with it. And to even go to Prop 2, it's important because their great greats don't haven't lived to see it. They have not, they're not living to see it, unfortunately. So now to be a part of history at this point of 2022, like you said, Mark, it's a great day to be alive. So I'm grateful to be a part of it. As I always say, as the Bible says, anything I find my hands to do, it's already going to be blessed. And thank you, Isaac. Thank you, Mark. And some of you are Matt, Debbie, I'm Matt, and a couple others. I'm appreciative for all of you. Hey, I'm here. And thank you for having me. Thank you so much uh, for being a part of 
this uh, 2.0. It's the remix. Wah, wah, wah. So I'm um, definitely um, just thrilled to have you uh, uh, with us. Uh, we've got one more speaker. We're running just a little bit behind, but I think we got this. Uh, we do have one more speaker with us, and I believe it was Max Parthas, wasn't it? Uh, peace, Brother Mark. Uh, greetings to everybody that is here. Uh, my name is Max Parthas. I am the National Campaign Coordinator for the Abolish Slavery National Network. I'm also the Acting uh, Director for the Paul Cuffey Abolitionist Center in Sumter, South Carolina, and a member of the Paul Cuffey Worship Group uh, among the Friends. Uh, there's so much to say in so little time. Uh, so I was asked to give somewhat of a personal testimony, and I'd like to do that, and then I want to give you an update on where we are today in the national efforts. First of all, um, I do want to acknowledge uh, that Vermont in 1777 did not abolish slavery. What they did was define the conditions under which a human being and a US citizen could be turned into profit, property. Uh, with Vermont, there were three exceptions. But as Mark has pointed out, that those initial conditions of creation, the Vermont butterfly effect spread out across the rest of the country. And some of those states had very nefarious purposes to use with it. States like Alabama and Tennessee and Louisiana, uh, who truly exploited this for convict leasing purposes. Uh, we also know that it was even adopted by the federal arm with the 13th Amendment, who felt that they had refined the language to limited to the, instead of the three that Vermont had, just the one as a punishment for a crime for those who have been duly convicted. And we know that slavery is illegal globally. It's uh, what we're doing, even simply by having it in your constitution, the federal constitution, and the other states that have it in their constitution is a violation of the uh, Declaration of Human Rights in Article 4, which abolishes slavery in all its forms. It has no exception for America to use it as a punishment for a crime. Uh, on a personal note, I would like to put a face and some reality onto the statistics when we say that Black people are incarcerated at a higher rate, the poverty is at a higher rate, and on and on and on, the brutality of the police, the mass incarceration. My family was at the heart of that, uh, ha always has been. I am a descendant of uh, African slaves here in the United States. I was raised by my great aunt, who in turn was raised by former slaves who had left Georgia to come to New Jersey, where I grew up. So I'm one generation aw away from a couple that were enslaved in the United States. Uh, we suffered the barbs and stings of what we call the badges and in incidents of slavery, which include the racism, the brutality, the mass incarceration, the gentrification, stealing our homes, using us as property to fill prison cells in order to create a revenue uh, for the city and its residents who were not Black. I watched my entire community of Patterson, New Jersey be destroyed under these policies that were uh, enabled through the badges and incidents of slavery. During these periods, I did not know about the 13th Amendment. Like many Americans, I had simply assumed that it did what it said, people said it had done. It ended slavery. And uh, not until I actually read it, <laughs> the 47 words, and saw that exception with my own eyes, did it really click. I know that over the course of several presidencies that this thing has escalated more and more, beginning with uh, Nixon's war on drugs in 1971, was my family and my community among those others who were uh, drastically affected by that. Then the same thing with Reagan's war on drugs, where he turned it into a literal war uh, during the Reagan years in the 1980s. Again, uh, we suffered through all of that. And then in the 1990s, 94, with the Clinton and Biden crime bill, we saw the prison industry and the prison population go from, in the 1970s, less than 200,000 people nationwide to 2.4 million people today. And the racial and control aspects of it, of it are very blatant. We have more Black men who are in cages right now in the United States than the top five 
populated African nations do combined. And they have nearly 600 million Africans. We only have 47 million people who define themselves as African-American or Black, and we still have more Black men in prisons and cages today than all of they, they have combined. Uh, one in eight Black prisoners throughout the world are right here in the United States. There are more Black men in prison than there are women of any race, creed, or color globally combined. So it is definitely affecting the Black population at a rate that is astounding. And I, as I said, was right at the heart of that. I remember in 1995, only a year after the Clinton crime bill, where they incentivized incarceration uh, for states that would adopt these new policies of zero drug tolerance, three strike laws, mandatory minimums. Uh, during that period, only a year later, there was a young man by the name of Lawrence Myers who was shot in the back of the head by a rookie policeman. Uh, rookie policeman because that was the Clinton's deal and Biden is that 100,000 new cops would be hired just like they're asking for right now. And one of them murdered a 16 year old boy, shot him right in the back of his head as he was laying face down on the ground uh, in downtown Patterson. And that began my journey because I knew that boy, I knew his family. 30 seconds left, okay, thank you very much, Debbie. I knew that family and that began my process of asking questions. And I found some answers. And the answer is this is all rooted in badges and incidents of slavery stemming from the exception clauses of the 13th Amendment, as well as the 25 states that have been mentioned who adopted this as a replacement for chattel slavery. But I'd like to give you some good news. As of our anniversary on August 28th for the Abolish Slavery National Network, we have abolished slavery in three states and adding to that Rhode Island, which was already done for a total of four. There are five states on the ballot right now where the citizens can vote to end slavery. That's of course, Vermont, Oregon, Tennessee, and Alabama and Louisiana. All five of them this year can have slavery removed from their state constitutions if the voters decide that's what they want to do. And in the coming uh, year, we have up as many as 24 other states that are following suit to do the same thing. Uh, so supporting Prop 2 uh, here and now in Vermont is the right thing to do, it's the moral thing to do, and it's the ethical thing to do. And it reminds me of scripture. Uh, I believe it was uh, John 9, 41, where Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees and they asked him if he thought they were blind. And he said, if you were truly blind, I would hold you blameless. But because you claim to see so well, I hold you at blame for every fault and failure. And that drives me every day because I do see well, just as well as you do. And you may decide to turn the other cheek or look the other way, but you can never again say that you did not know. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for all of you who have uh, told your stories. Thank you all. After all of that, folks ought to be fired up right now, ready to play an active role in this work that we're doing to, so we can get this campaign done, so we can win. So to tell you more about how you can get involved, we've got Melissa Bata in the house. Hey, Melissa. Hey there, Mark. Thanks so much. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Melissa Bata. I'm the Deputy Director of Vermont Interfaith Action, and I live in um, central Vermont outside of the capital in Barrytown. Um, yeah, so we, we're, we're, I'm excited. I'm excited because as of today, we have 191 volunteers signed up to do this work. And that is amazing. Our goal is 300, but I believe that we can do it with 191 if we need to. Um, so we're gonna keep on going out and uh, seeing if we can drum up some more support, um, find more volunteers and, and get this moving. Um, so yeah, uh, Ryan, thanks for putting that up on the, um, on the screen there, we, um, as you can see, we have a campaign timeline that we've been working on. And um, <clears throat> what I want to just kind of point out is uh, down in the, the far uh, left-hand corner there, down at the bottom, that's where we're at right now, right? We're, we're in August, we have, we have 12 weeks, so three months from, um, from now, uh, we will have an election again, and this will be on the ballot. And so right now what we're doing is, Kind of being a little low key, right? I mean, folks 
kind of we just had the primaries they're not really wanting to see political signs up so much or they're not really wanting to talk with folks they just want to kind of enjoy their summer so we're taking advantage of the opportunities that we have um, in our state for the summertime we're tabling at outdoor events i was just there um, in downtown berry city at the farmer's market on wednesday with um, a couple of volunteers and mark stopped by um, had some great conversations with folks a lot of folks were like i did not know that we have exceptions to slavery in the state constitution and that's horrible that that our constitution has now paved the way for other states in our federal government to also make exceptions um, and they're saying yes of course we want to pledge um, to vote yes um, on, prop, um, on prop two um, with a few new volunteers uh, we'll also be um, Ryan here who has been helping us with all of our tech this evening um, will be helping us uh, get some social media posts that we can start posting out and kind of ramp up that um, to, to have more social media posts going out and we could share those with friends, we can share those with our, um, our faith communities, our neighbors um, and, and have that going. Uh, Ryan, are you trying to uh, pull up one right now or <laughs> um, I don't know who's, I, I need the screen back y'all. <laughs> But as we go into August, um, or after we close out August and we go into September, um, we will be starting to do um, what we like to call relational organizing. And um, just kind of want to explain that and unpack that because I think sometimes it's hard for folks to understand. Relational organizing is just that it's about the relationships that we already have. Um, going on those relationships and those ties and telling folks about Prop 2 letting our neighbors know, letting our family members who are who are Vermonters and can vote in Vermont, letting them know, letting our congregation members know, um, telling other people about Prop 2. I mean, you all know what happens. You go to the ballot, you see something, or you go to the polls to vote, you see something on the ballot that you don't really understand and you just skip it. Or you want to say one thing and you end up voting something else. That's, that's what happened to our friends out in Colorado when they were trying to, to abolish slavery from their state constitution is that people were, thought they were voting one way, but they were actually voting against it and they voted it down without even knowing it. And then they had to do the process all over again. So we're just trying to, to stop that. And we're trying to educate our friends and neighbors as we go. So we'll be, do, we'll be doing some training on how we can have these one-on-one -on -one conversations with our friends and family um, reaching out to them. We'll be training, um, we'll be doing some kitchen table talks where we can do some small group talks, whether that be at our congregations with coworkers, inviting folks over for, um, for a chat, that sort of thing. And in five of our urban areas, we've decided we're gonna do some door knocking where we can go door to door easily while the weather's still nice. Um, hopefully it will be continue this cooler trend and not like what we had last weekend, um, but we'll be doing some of that as well. On September 26th, ballots will be mailed and we'll start launching our get out the vote work. That's what GOTV stands for. And that kind of work is just following up with folks and making sure that they remember that they pledge to vote yes on Prop 2. Um, we'll do that through phone banking, following up um, with those that vote, um, have filled out the pledge cards, maybe with some postcards, maybe with some text messages, maybe with some emails, some phone calls. However, is the best way to reach folks just to remind them that it's time to get out, time to vote, and, and make sure that we get this passed and, and we put this on the books in, in Vermont. Um, and then on November 8th, um, you know, we're, we're thinking of having an election night watch party. We want to celebrate this win, right? We want to get around with others and say, this is amazing. This is historic, you know, and, and where do we go from here? So we're looking forward to that as well. Um, one other piece that I want to let folks know is uh, we need all hands on deck and we understand, I understand everybody has a lot going on. Some of you probably have some vacation that you're still planning on taking, while the weather's still nice, maybe some camping, some traveling. Um, but uh, what we're going to be doing is we have had a standing Monday evening call from 7.30 to 8. We're going to shift it up just a little bit um, as the days get a little bit shorter and it gets darker out. It's, it's harder to stay up that late, at least for me. I'm ready to go to bed at uh, six o'clock some nights when uh, when the, when the, it starts getting darker. Um, but so we're going to be um, shifting our calls up to, from seven to eight. We're going to extend it a little bit because in some of these um, calls, we're actually going to be doing some training. So um, the first half hour is going to be uh, the same that we've um, been doing, which is is just doing 
kind of our basic checking in, hearing stories, um, sharing some best practices with one another, and then um, and hearing what's what's up for the week. Like what kind of activities are we doing for the week? And then the last half hour, sometimes 20 minutes, maybe 45 minutes, depending on how long that first part takes, we'll be doing some training on some of these weeks. Um, if you've already been trained on what, we, what we're training on, you don't have to stick around. You'll just be there for the first part of it. But we wanna just make sure that we can bring more folks in and that as people come in, they can come in at any time and just be ready to go with us on this campaign. So if you have questions, feel free to reach out to any of the staff that are on the call tonight. You have myself, Debbie, Ryan, and Mike with Vermont Interfaith Actions. You have Mark, Maya, Isaac and Vincent with uh, Vermont Racial Justice Alliance. We're more than happy to answer questions and to follow up with you all and just, you know, are excited to be working with you all together on this historic um, campaign. So thanks so much. Oh, and let me put the, in the chat box, I will put the link for our Monday night call. So if you wanna to register tonight, you can go ahead and register. Um, jump on when you can, you know, if you miss, that's fine. We might follow up with you, but um, we'd be happy to have you there with us on Monday evenings. Thank you for that, Melissa. Thank you for that very uh, comprehensive uh, overview of how to get involved. You guys have heard everything. You've heard everything you need to know. You, you've got all the information. You got all the background. The only thing you didn't get is excuses because we're getting it done. I'm telling you, this is this thing is on fire right now. I think everybody ought to be pretty stoked. But just in case you didn't get enough, I got Earl Cooper Camp up right now. Don't forget, um, uh, by the way, on Thursdays, we're also gonna, uh, Maya will drop in the chat something about Thursday, or maybe somebody can drop in the chat. I don't know how that's gonna work, about how to uh, catch up with us on Thursdays because we have a deeper dive. Earl Cooper Camp, can you give it to us? Get us wound up a little bit, brother. It's good to Thank see you. Thank you, brother Mark. So uh, good evening, my sisters, brothers, and siblings. I'm Earl Cooper Camp, as Mark said, from the Episcopal Church of the Good Shepherd in Barry. Now, when was the last time you made history? How many times in our lives do we get to do something that is truly of historic importance? Well, tonight, now and over the next few months, we have the opportunity to do something historic, both for our own times and for a legacy for the future generations of Vermonters, of people in our nation and people around the globe. Now, I recall that about five years ago, I was in an airport lounge with my brother, Mark Hughes, and uh, we're traveling to Nashville for a training with the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival. And Mark now mentioned to me that slavery, yes, yeah, slavery is still permitted in the Vermont Constitution. And I, I was just floored. I'd heard years ago from many proud Vermonters who'd learned it as an article of faith in their elementary school that Vermont was the first state to abolish slavery. Well, Mark pulled out his phone, brought up the Article I of the state constitution, and there it was. The exception that people under 21 could be slaves. And I was, like I said, I was just floored. And I said, Mark, we got to get those damn 36 words out of the constitution. Well, tonight, to my, my sisters and brothers and siblings, we can do that. Just like those early Vermonters gathered in that tavern in Windsor in 1777, we can do something historic and abolish slavery for good in our time. We can finish that historic work begun 245 years ago in this brave little state. Now, this historic work is not only something that we can do, it is something that we must do. We not only have the opportunity to act, now we also have the moral duty to act. And that's the historic nature of our call this evening that knowing the past pain, the injustices of slavery, its genocidal effect on the African-American and indigenous communities in our nation, knowing of slavery's foundations in the sin of white supremacy, this is our moral duty now to strike out those damn 36 words, abolish slavery in Vermont once and for all. Now, some might say, even members of my own family, but there's no slavery in Vermont. We have more important things to do. Don't you believe it? The call to act, 
This call to act is in accord with our moral duty in these times to set right the historical legacy of our state, to acknowledge the past wrongs, and then to seek now to live in a deeper justice. That's the most important thing that we can do now. This is an historic opportunity for our time, and as I said, for generations yet to come. Now, as Dr. King famously said, the arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. It is our moral duty together to make that bend a little more pronounced now, moving towards justice in this campaign to abolish slavery in Vermont. We've heard this evening what we need to know. Indeed, I think uh, uh, um, Mark and Melissa and Debbie and everybody has really talked about what it is that we need to do to accomplish this goal. Each one of us needs to enlist our families. And as Ms. Kelly said, as Melissa said, we need to educate our children, whether they're eight years old or 88 years old. Each one of us needs to enlist our families, our friends, our coworkers, and especially our fellow colleagues congregation members in this effort. And it's not going to be easy, but together, finding that strength and inspiration in each other, together we can accomplish this historic task. Together, we can open the door a little bit wider to that promise of liberty and justice for all. So my sisters, my brothers, my siblings, Will you join me? Will you join with Vermont Racial Justice Alliance? Will you join with Vermont Interfaith Action in this historic work, in this moral duty to abolish slavery in Vermont? And I want to hear you. Will you join me? We are about that life here. Yes, we yes. are. Yes. 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 Thank you so much. Thank yes. you. Yes. Amen. Amen. I felt Amen. the spirit on that one. Uh, Mr. Earl. Wow, <laughs> that was amazing. Thank you so much, Earl, for being here with us. Everybody just go like this. Like, yeah, all the way. Little Thank you so break. much. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I was getting ready to jump, uh, jump up and just uh, run across the room as it is my tradition in my faith. You can do uh, the happy so dance. That's good. That's good. Let the spirit take you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and, um, you know, there are so many um, reflections that I have uh, to, you know, to be able to just to express about the times that I've had with uh, Brother Earl Cooper Camp and the love that I have for him. But uh, I'm not going to do that uh, because we actually have my brother Winters uh, coming with a reflection. Uh, come on, Brother Winters, where you at? I'm, hey, I'm still, a minute, still bro. hearing praise, <laughs> Earl. Uh, just uh, to kind of offer offer words uh, uh, for us to take with us as we go. Um, first of all, just to pause and remember uh, generations of enslaved people. Some of you can remember names, maybe even faces from family stories. Some of you can maybe not remember a name or a face, but you can remember places, places in our country that were built with stolen labor. Let's remember those generations of enslaved people who built so much of this country. And let's also remember that every time our country has started to give those enslaved people, just a little bit of freedom. It seems like there's always a, a, a brand new mechanism to continue uh, the oppression and to re-enslave those enslaved folks in some new and insidious way. But not this time, we pray, not this time. And so, for that reason, we pray with open eyes and open hands and feet ready to walk and march even still to do the work that will need to be done again because of what's going to happen in response to this thing that we are going to do because that's the way evil is. 
It never rests, and neither can we. And so as we go from this place, we go with glad heart for all the work that has been done, for all the truth that has been spoken, for, for all the effort that has been marshaled into this cause. But we go knowing that the work is not finished till it's finished. And even when we think it's finished, there'll be more for us to do. And what a joy it is to be able to do it in the company of, of such good folks. And so we pray to the God of those that we remember for strength and for courage, for peace in these troubled times, for hope when we seem at times to be surrounded by despair. And we go to live in love. Amen. Man, hopefully <clears throat> that was a valuable experience uh, for for all of you who come. <clears throat> in the tradition of my faith, uh, in what is known as the the international standard uh, version of the Bible, does a scripture that says that uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to tell the good news to the poor. He has sent me to announce to the prisoners and recovery of the sight to the blind, <clears throat> to set the oppressed people free. So as we uh, go forth uh, from this place, uh, let us carry forward with us the words in our hearts, our moral responsibilities, our moral responsibilities to set the captives free. So let's go forward from this place. Thank you all who have attended tonight. Uh, this uh, Thanks for sponsoring this event, Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, Vermont Interfaith Action. All of you have a wonderful night.